you look back at what you had to do and how long you had to work and what you had to sacrifice to get where you are at our age as we, I probably got you by a year or two, but, uh, my military career started in the seventies. I December 31st, 1976, I raised my hand, got on the delayed entry plan, went in in April of 77. So I was in in the 70s. I was in in the 80s. I was in in the 90s. I was in in the 2000s. I was in in the 2010s. 25 years to cover in a 50-year span, in a mm -hmm. five-decade span. And I look back, I mean, my first overseas assignment as out of flight school was Korea. I left. My son was two weeks old. And that's what we did. That's what was expected of you. And to push back against that, you were considered, I wouldn't necessarily say weak, but you were, you were considered to be maybe a problem child because now we have to arrange things around you. <clears throat> right. And, and uh, when you've got, 60 pilots in a Chinook unit, you can't have everything arranged around one person or one small group of people. It has to be for the group. So you have to learn that you have to sacrifice to fit into the group, to make the group well. I think that's one of the things we've lost in the military now. Well, how common was it back then to have problem child? Because I noticed the difference towards the end of my career. The problem child's got more than it was when I first joined. Well, it just seems like... The discipline. I think that's generational. Mm, yeah. I, I, not only that, but leadership. Uh, you know, it, people will, they will take as much as you will give. Right. And it doesn't matter what it is. It's money. It's attention. It's uh, the ability to have my way. They'll take that as much as they can get it. That's just, I think, human nature in a lot of people, depending on how they were reared. Some parents wouldn't put up with that. And so those kind, but that's old generation. Those parents are old school. And that's the kind of parent I grew up with. My dad, career army officer, and I grew up old school. Get my back end busted if I did something wrong. Uh, with high expectations, school, education, that kind of stuff. And if you didn't meet those expectations, you, you paid the consequences. There were consequences. I think we've lost a lot of that. I think a lot of the consequences have gone away. Now we try to cater to every single little minority out there and give them their way. And a lot of times at the expense of the majority. And uh, so, you know, if you're, if you're the squeaky wheel and you're getting your way all the time, you're going to continue to squeak. Right. So it's like, so, so I think that's kind of, to go back to your question, I, I believe that uh, the military has gone down the woke road, and you probably saw this as well as I did, that it reached a point, um, that longevity of my military career stretching over five decades, I saw a lot of changes and I grew up with my dad in the Brown boot army and the discipline in the Brown boot army. And most of that was still there when I went in the seventies, but I watched it degrade through the years and it reached a point where <clears throat> good leaders were leaving the military because they didn't want to put up with the crap. They said it because the ingratiators, the butt kickers, the butt kissers, not the butt kickers, the butt kissers were the ones that were getting the promotions because they'd go to the, they'd go to the leadership of the battalion or the company or whatever. And, eh, I like it like you like it and right or wrong. And, uh, and so they were the ones that started to get promoted and come up the chain of command and they'd climb up that ladder of success by sticking knives in other people's backs to lift themselves up another notch. And those were the ones that were getting promoted and still are. And I look at like Miley, at general, that's a woke individual. And uh, he's the kind that stuck around and got promoted up through the ranks by doing exactly what I just described. And so to me, it's, uh, you got to, yeah, recruiting right now, it's terrible. Why? Nobody wants to go in it. Why? Look at what it is now. 
it's lost its purpose. Everybody's hearing the stories of what's going on in there, and they're like, wow. Yep. Don't want to be a part of that. I'm, I'm going to get stuck in that for so you want, you want to fix you want to fix some of the things we've got in the uh, issues we've got in our country. Put discipline back in it. You know, discipline's been taken out of the military. They tried to take it out of the police departments. They tried to take it out of the schools. They've taken it out of the family. They've taken it out of the churches. You better get discipline back in some of this stuff, or we're going to spiral downward, and we're going to reach a point we're not going to recover. I think we're close to that now. I do too. I do too. And my dad, my dad, re retired colonel, still living, be 93 next month, December. He has said a long time, he said, we won't reverse things until we hit rock bottom. And we're, I can see rock bottom from where we are now. I thought we were rock bottom a while ago, and it just seems to keep on getting more and more down. I'm like, well, Well, maybe. I look back at during COVID and the supply chain issues that we had and the, the fact that uh, you, you couldn't get toilet paper. You couldn't get baby formula. That's the kind of thing that – that's the kind of thing that is rock bottom. And uh, there's an old saying. I, I did a lot of work military down in South Central America. And there was a, a saying down there, you're five missed meals away from a revolution. You, you want to make people mad enough to do something? Let them and their family and their kids go hungry. Mm. That's what people will rear up. It's just like the mothers now in schools and they're, the stuff that has gone on, for instance, in Virginia, in those schools. And what happened? It got a conservative Republican elected to the governorship of Virginia. Why? Because you angered Mama Bear. Don't, don't anger Mama Bear. Mm. You mess with the Cubs, you've messed up, and it will come back and bite you in the ass. And I'm afraid that we are headed for rock bottom. And but then when we hit there, it's going to be it's going to be people worried about their quality of life, meals, uh, eating, feeding their families, having electricity in their homes, having the money to pay for that, and uh, it's. I, I just think we're not quite there, but we're headed there strongly. And uh, I looked at the, this last election that we just had about a week ago and, and the fact that policies are so bad, but yet we seem to keep electing people that want to keep those policies. You know, and so I, it, I so then that brings me to the question of the integrity of our election <laughs> that's, process. That's what I was just getting ready to say. That is the thing that concerns me right now more than anything else. If we don't have integrity in our election system, we're just a third world country. We're a banana republic. Who can you trust? Basically nobody. I'm afraid that uh, many of our governmental agencies – FBI, DOJ, a number of others, Department of Defense, have been taken over by those that they don't give a flip about our country. All they want to do is increase their power and increase the monetary benefits that come with that power. That's all they're interested in. Whereas you and I, when we went off and served and we did some dirty stuff when we served, but and and I don't know. I think you're the, you're a lot like me. It was about this is for my country. You know, I, my country means more to me, and and that goes back to the way my dad reared me. You know, it's like God, country, family. You know, it's like, and we did that. And I look now at the 25 years that I served on active duty, and I go, God, was a was a all this going on back then, and I just missed it. <laughs> yeah, I've <clears throat> I've questioned myself for a while now, and I'll give you an example. Um, my mom was a uh, pretty conservative. I mean, what I call a Republican, though. I mean, she was conservative in her values, and um, then the, the decision to uh, go to Iraq came, and you know, she was extremely supportive of me, and by the time time I came back. And oh, <clears throat> first time like in oh four, oh five time frame. <clears throat> a couple of years later, I go home on leave, and she would start talking about 
you know, we shouldn't be in this war, or this is, for, you know, blah, 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 you know. And it just, it just made me irate. I mean, I'm not irate on my mom. I'm not, you know, but inside I'm like, who who are you? You know I mean? You're not <laughs> who I thought you were, thinking like that. I mean, how could you be an, an American and think something like that? Mm-hmm. And <clears throat> all these people over there fighting, blah, 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 for this country, and you're questioning, and da, 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 you know, and all this stuff. And unfortunately, she passed away um, in 20, and it was, wasn't was until the COVID situation until I started questioning everything. You know, I just, I didn't really see, I mean, obviously, every government's going to have its issues and everything, so I never really paid that much attention to what was going on. But ever since I saw some of the stuff that was happening around the COVID, we can go into that a little bit more, but I started questioning everything. Sure. And then I started looking back and I kind of started questioning the Iraq thing a little bit, but I really didn't put too much thought on it because every time I did it, I was like, you know what, that's in the past. I need to focus on what's going on now and in the future. But then I started really th- thinking about it. And I'm like, you know, she was right. <laughs> we had yeah. no we had no business in that country, no. in my opinion. <clears throat> but yet at the time when it was going on and Colin Powell is presenting all yep. this evidence that right. we, we should do this and these weapons of mass destruction, you and I were in the military. Yep. And right. Like, well, it's our it's our job to protect our country, and so we went based upon what we were being told, because we trusted them. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, something that I've learned in in all the traveling that I've done, I can go to China. Uh, I worked for Coca Cola for a while, flying the CEO, and uh, we did a lot of traveling in all the countries I went to. I think Coke was in over two hundred twenty countries then. And so all the countries I went to, one of the things that I carried away from all that was most of the time, people get along. I got along great with the Chinese people. They were some of the nicest people that I had ever met on the street. And I I can go to countries like Nicaragua, El Salvador, Honduras, where back in the day, all they wanted to do was kill us. When we were down there during the Reagan years. And now it's, you're welcome. You know, everybody laughs and drinks beer together and has a good time. It's not the people of the countries that are the problem. It's the leadership of the countries. Absolutely. And then you have to ask yourself, why? Why do these leaders continue to push their agendas? And these agendas too oftentimes lead us towards conflict. And what? death of young people, death of young people that don't really have a dog in the fight, but they're doing what they conceive as their duty. You know, they see this as their duty because like you and I, just like me and you in the time, we were told it's your duty to go do that. And we did it. We did it based on too often times based on lies. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and Conflict so, is profitable. It is. And whether it's the Democrats or the Republicans, you go back to the Eisenhower administration when he left, what did he say? Beware of the great defense industrial complex. You know, it's once again, it's about money and it's about power. It's not about taking care of our country. My dad makes a statement that I've heard for years. In our country now, we have too many politicians and not enough statesmen. Yeah. No. You know, and what happened to the intent of our founding fathers? What what has happened to that? And I'm afraid it we have, due to size, corruption, et cetera, et cetera, we've taken a turn somewhere along the way that was never what the intent was of this nation. The average citizen now has basically no say in the direction of our country. And then why? Because the big money guys do. They well, buy the direction that they want. Well, I think we give a lot of, we've given up a lot of our freedoms over the years for comfort. You know what I mean? What I mean by that is, you know, if you're going to make something easier for me, then yeah, you go ahead and do it. I'm not going to bitch too much about some of the, some of the freedoms that I have. Um, no matter what you're, what your opinion is on COVID? Um, my bis- my biggest disagreement with it was a mandate for a vaccination. Yeah, me too. And the way they're still pushing it, <clears throat> right? And the and the reason wasn't at the time I wasn't against the vaccine. 
Did you, so, get, did you get vaccinated? I did, I did not. I did not either. So, and I really wasn't against other people getting. I didn't. I didn't really have an opinion on it. But what really started bugging me was them trying to force you to do it. I mean, I pretty much was getting fired within twelve <laughs> within twelve hours. I was going to be getting fired if I didn't do something drastic. Um, looking back at it now, it wasn't that drastic, but. Um, even when you had a religious exemption or whatever that you wanted, they were like, that's not, not good enough. That's good enough. Not good enough. Religion, not good enough. Yeah. Come on. When did that happen in our country? When are you, when, okay. You're, are you religious? I'm like, well, what's the matter if, what is your definition of what, <laughs> if I'm religious or not? Yeah. Do I believe in a higher spirit? Do I believe in God? Do I do this? I mean, is there a questionnaire that I have to go through to, for you to believe that I'm religious and enough, there, and there's a reason for why I don't want this vaccine. Yeah, I mean, I sucked up my personal values all through the military because that's what I signed up to do. You know, I knew going in that I was going to lose some freedoms, and everybody that goes in the military ought to know you're going. You know, you're. But you're told that up front. Yeah, you're told up front. You're. You know, you're going to lose. You don't have what everybody else does. No, but. You agree to that. And by the way, you're being judged by two different judicial systems now, too. <laughs> Absolutely. So when you go through boot camp, they jab you with every kind of thing that you can think of. And throughout the years, you're getting anthrax shots and this kind of shot and this kind of shot. Even then, don't question it. You no. know, and, and some people did. And you know what? They they were dealt with when, when, when they right. questioned it. Like, they were hey, put out. Oh, you don't want to take a flu shot? That goes against my record. Uh, you know, you got to do something. Now, they were probably more um, apt to sign a religious waiver for you because, hey, if that's your religion, because some of these vaccines do have some stuff in there that people sure. don't agree with. So it wasn't that big of a deal if you had an exemption. Well, But to get out and retire, I retired, I did my service, and I'm like, okay, I'm going to enjoy my civilian life. I want my life, freedoms back. And I'm going to, you know, I'm going to live out the rest of my life nice, as quietly and as humbly as I can. And now you're going to tell me that I can't go to my job because of something that I don't agree with, you know, for a vaccine. Sure. And um, once that became such a big deal of me saying I didn't really agree with that, um, then th what they didn't realize is that made a lot of people question stuff. Yeah. Which it did for me. <clears throat> I, I would still be in the dark about a lot of the stuff that's going on in this country, probably, if it, if it wasn't for that. If it wasn't for them. It triggered the question. Absolutely. And I think it's done it to a lot of people. I do, too. A I, lot I of do, people. too. And I think that Trump coming along and and uh, I don't think he exposed the in-depth level of the corruption within our government. But he shined a light on the surface sure. of it. Yep. And when he did, the cockroaches scrambled and tried to take him out. Every which, and they still are. Mm -hmm. I honestly believe that they will try to kill tr Donald Trump if they can't stop him through this bogus legal process they're going through right now. I would, I, I would, you know, depends what conspiracy theory you think. But if the conspiracy was deep enough to take out a president of the United States once upon a time, do you think that that would hesitate to take out a presidential candidate? Right. Not at all. And I'm fearful for that for him because he doesn't deserve that. That man, whether you like him or not, look what he did during his presidency. Listen, I didn't like I didn't like the way he talked to people either. No. I, I, I didn't like it. Matter of fact, it really turned me off. But the policies that he did, I mean— there's no, there's no perfect person. There's no perfect candidate. Mm -mm. You're going to have to take the good with the bad, and and that that's a, <laughs> you're going to define it with that guy. You, you do, know, you and know what I I'm think saying? with him, you get the truth, Absolutely. whether you like it or not, right? And, or you're going to get his truth. Yeah, you are. Whether you're going to agree with him or not, that's right. And, and uh, you go back to the disillusionment and uh, the second guessing that came with COVID. I was in a country and very desolate country in Africa doing stuff for chasing bad guys and uh, guys that wanted to do harm to our country and our people. And this country, the people were so poor. They live on top of each other in cardboard boxes. They have no medical care to speak of. And uh, so we were operating out of that country and it was, it 
COVID developed, we were reading about it in the United States and, you know, the people that were dying and all this people that they were saying with COVID deaths, et cetera, et cetera, which to this day, I like, yeah, right, bullshit. But my thoughts were if COVID ever hits this country, they're going to be stacking these people by like cordwood by the road. They're going to be dying by the thousands based on the information I had and what I was being told. COVID hit the country and we would get reports from their, their government. Well, X number of people infected, zero deaths. X plus 100 infected, zero deaths. X plus 500 infected, one death. And the ratios didn't add up to what we're being told in the United States and developed countries. Mm -hmm. So that's when I went, somebody's lying to somebody here. And that's when I really started to question that whole thing. And even to this day, the COVID thing, you know, okay, why do you guys really not want to expose where it originated? Why does our country not want to point the finger where it is? Why maybe there's somebody corrupt that's involved and they don't want because it'll splash back on them. That, and then I came back when I left there. I, I was locked down over there, lived in a shipping container for four and a half months because we couldn't get out due to COVID. Couldn't come back to the U.S. because our airport that we were operating out of was closed for any incoming aircraft or outgoing aircraft unless we went and did our mission and came back to there. We couldn't land at any intermediate place. So when I finally got out of there and I came back and my first stop in the United States was Dulles. And I got off the little train that takes you to the terminal. And I looked to my left and I looked to my right. And this is busy, one of the busiest commercial airports in the world. And there was nobody there. There was nobody to my left all the way down that long hall or to my right to all those other gates. There was nobody there. And I went, what in the hell has happened to my country? Mm. You know, and, and the more that I read and the more that I studied and the more that was that we discovered, that's not true. They said that, but that's not true. And I did like you did. And, and I've been doing, uh, I think it, I was already doing it, but I think this sped, sped me up. Uh, I was already extremely doubtful of our government and uh, things that I was seeing. I mean, I, I, I think for me, it really started when Obama weaponized the IRS and started coming after conservative people. And, and granted, I'm a conservative. Uh, I don't think that people would say I'm a radical conservative that know me. They know that uh, I'm a reasonable person. But uh, when I saw that in, I think her name was Lois Lerner, was the IRS lady that had weaponized it against certain people. She got off basically scot-free. Mm -hmm. Nothing. Nothing. And that's what I see is nobody is being held responsible for anything. You could talk Republicans. You can talk Democrats. Nobody's being held responsible. They're talking now about subpoena, subpoenaing, issuing subpoenas for Hunter Biden. Really? We're three over three years into this president's tenure, and now you're talking? I don't trust the Republicans any more than I trust the Democrats. Nope. I agree. They're, they're politicians. They've got up there. They do what's necessary. They say what's necessary. Goes back to what my dad said. You got a handful of states and, and a lot of politicians. And so, no, I'm, I'm with you on that one. I, my, our government is, I don't trust them. It's a shame. And uh, I don't know what it would take to regain my trust. I was going to be in my next question. What's it going to take? And you said rock bottom, but where where is rock bottom? I mean, I thought we hit rock bottom a couple times now. I thought I think rock bottom is when people are so needy for the basic necessities of life that they come trying to take them from you and me and people that have prepared. I think that's when we know we've hit rock bottom. When the when these that are doing some of these things that they're that's happening in big cities now starts to come to the suburbs, starts to come to the rural areas, that's when we've hit rock bottom. Uh, people want to take what's yours and what's mine, and they're desperate to do it. It's not just doing it because it's the easy way. It's doing it because maybe they've got to feed their family back somewhere. 
That's when I think that I would call that rock bottom. Mm -hmm. And they can't get food. They can't get baby supplies. They can't get medical. And we saw a glimpse of it during COVID. No. And us, uh, but we've recovered to a degree, but I don't think people understand how fragile the supply chain is. It doesn't take much and they'll throw it all out of whack. When it does. I kind of question. I don't know enough about it to, to speak intelligently about it, but it just, I understand that the supply chain is fragile. However, was it made that bad? What I mean, was there really not toilet paper around? <laughs> uh, are you asking if some of it wasn't intentional? Well, that's a question I have. I'm not, I, I'm not saying it was, it was, but it's it's a question. I mean, you know, everybody's grabbing nine or ten things of toilet paper, and that's why we don't have any. I'm like, well, you know. Maybe we brought some of that on ourselves. Yeah. Panic. Yeah. Well, you let things get worse. Right. The panic gets worse. Sure. And yeah. you know, you've seen it. The military, we've been in places where we saw panic in the local populace. We know what that does. Mm. And... Uh, I think if we get to that point in this country, and I don't think it's that far away, but if we do, it's going to get very, very ugly. <clears throat> 1970, went in the Army. 77. 77. What made you do that? Because you're, obviously you have a, your family's background as military, but... You know, it's funny. I graduated. My dad was stationed with NATO when I graduated high school. I graduated high school in Shape, Belgium. And uh, I, I did well on my ACT and SAT. I, I goofed off in high school, but my ACT and SATs I scored very, very high. And I had the I had the option of going to one of the military academies, and uh, and I got accepted to several major universities. But my dad had attended a small college in North Alabama, and to me, that's all I wanted to do. Well, before before I. Uh, left, my dad sat down with me, and when we were look, talking at colleges and all this, and he said, "What are you going to do? You're going to go to the mil to the this military academy?" And uh, I looked at him and I said, "No, Dad. I said I was born the year you were on active duty. I said I don't want to ever have anything to do with the military the rest <laughs> of my life." Right. And that was when I graduated in 1971, and so I went back to that school. And I still had more play in me, responsibility or maturity. And uh, I, they didn't like me. I, it was winter, and I didn't have a workshop, so all I had was a little motorcycle. I took it up to the eighth floor and worked on it in my dorm room, and and I probably got away with it, but uh, they didn't like me riding it around just check on the floor to make sure it was fixed. So they kind of booted me out of the out of the dorm. That's kind of extreme, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I thought that was rather extreme. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I didn't do well that first year of college. I goofed off, so I kind of quit. Then I started working building houses. And, and uh, I think my first paycheck was I brought home $67.50 for a 40-hour week, slinging a 16, 18-ounce claw hammer all day. And uh, then I went into building boats. And, and, and I was pretty... I was, had a wild streak, and I was doing some things I shouldn't have been doing. And and uh, But my dad and my mom came from small towns in Alabama, and my dad was a, a disciplinarian. And I was out from under their wings for the first time in my life, and I didn't know how to handle all that freedom, and I did a lot of goofy, stupid crap. And, uh, but... I kind of waded through all that. And then in 1974, uh, my mom and dad and sister had come back from Belgium. And uh, he got a assignment overseas by himself to Thailand, logistician. And he went over there in 74. And my mom decided to go uh, visit him over there. And she left me and my sister for the longest that she had ever left my sister. 
and my sister got killed in a car wreck while mm. she was gone. 17, had just graduated high school. I was only, I was, we were the only two kids. And so that was pretty, that was pretty devastating to the family. And uh, my dad came to me and he said, look, he said, I got a compassionate reassignment to Atlanta. Your mom really needs you. Would you be willing to come back home for a while and go to school? I said, yeah. So I did. I moved back in and I uh, went to Georgia Tech and went for a couple of years to Georgia Tech. And, and then uh, kind of dawned on me looking around. This is an engineering school. And I was working. To, I wanted to be an aeronautical engineer. And so I was working towards that. I uh, picked up the paper one day and was reading it. This is long before Internet stuff. I picked up the paper and read it. And Boeing laid out 5,000 aeronautical engineers up in the Seattle area. And I was like, hmm, these are, these are going to be a lot of experienced people on the market here. Hmm. I kept going. And I'm looking. And then one day, and you got to remember, I'm like a 21-year-old kid at this point. And uh, driven by the hormones of a 21-year-old, I look around Georgia Tech, there's 12 to 13 guys for every girl on campus, engineering school. And I'm like, this is, mm, I don't, this is, mm, this is not for me. So I thought I'd improve my odds and join the army. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> and uh, yeah, how'd so, that work? <laughs> so I did. I left. And I I became an enlisted soldier. I went in. Uh, the army to me was easy because I'd grown up in it, and I didn't realize how easy. And the army was so black and white. Then you do this. This is going to happen. You do this. This is going to happen. You don't do this. Yeah, we're going to get you. So my, I had, I was a hellraiser. I'll never forget when I went in and enlisted in '77. My dad, he's still in a colonel now at this point. His advice to me going out the door was, you know, when you get in trouble, you Don't got a choice <laughs> between a court martial and an Article 15. Take the Article 15, and I'm like, okay, okay. So I go off, Fort Dix, New Jersey. Trainee of the cycle out of 610 people, number one. My dad's like, who's this kid? You know, I go to Chinook school, mechanic school, self-paced course, set a new record going through the course. And it, it, it was natural. I was a natural at it. It wasn't hard. I mean, I knew right shoulder arms, left shoulder arms, right face, left face, yes, sir, fall in, fall out. I, I grew up with it. Right. So it was very easy. And uh, so that I knew I, I knew I needed a trade. And at that point, I was content to become an aircraft mechanic. And uh, I had really had no higher aspirations than that. And I went in. I did three years. I served in uh, Chinook units. I was, uh, started off as a mechanic on a maintenance team. Then I went, became a crew chief, then a flight engineer. And, uh, Were you single this whole time? At the yeah. be at the beginning, yeah. My entire enlisted was single, and uh, so I I stayed in until eighty, and uh, the army tried to get me to reenlist. I said no, want to didn't want any part of the military again. So I went and got my FAA airframe power plant license so that I could work on aircraft, and I did, and. Uh, when I was working on them in the Army and flying on the airplanes, the aircraft that I worked on, I got a lot of job satisfaction out of that. Well, when I ended up just being, just being, and I don't mean this derogatorily, a mechanic, and I couldn't fly on the airplane, the aircraft that I worked on anymore, I'd fix them, and some cocky young ass pilot had come waddling his ass out there after I've worked on it all night, fixed all the deficiencies. He'd come waddling out there, not so much as a thank you, kiss my ass, whatever, and get in and take off, fly away. And I was like, mm, I don't like this. I don't like this. So the Army kept sending me stuff, wanting me to come back into my old job. Oh, we'll give you your rank back and all this stuff. So one day I was on the way to work for a helicopter company in Lafayette, Louisiana. And I drove by a recruiter 
and I had this stack of stuff that they had sent me. And I went into the recruiter's office and I said, laid it down on his desk and said, get me off your mailing list. <laughs> he said, what? I said, there is no way in the world that I would ever consider going back in the military. Really nice guy, E7, black E7, nice guy, great guy. And uh, he let me get about halfway to the door. He said, okay, I, I can't guarantee you I can get you off the mailing list, but I I'll try. I promise you I'll try. He let me get about halfway to the door, and he said, uh, well, Mr. Barnwell, what if I could put you straight into flight school? Well, this on the heels of not having a lot of job satisfaction, watching these cocky little pilots do their thing. I, he said that, and my head said, keep walking, <laughs> keep walking. <laughs> and my heart said, stop and listen. No. Four months later, 4.30 in the morning, I'm getting yelled and screamed at at Fort Rucker, Alabama by TAC officers. Right. So, And at that point, I said, I've got a six, I don't remember, six or seven year commitment after flight school. And it was like, uh, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be at 10, 11 years. I can retire at 20. I think I'll just stick around and, and do it. And, and I did well, you know, in the military. I did well. I became an instructor in every aircraft that I flew. And, and, uh, so you <clears throat> was a mechanic on Chinooks. Did you go back and fly Chinooks or did, I did? did you? Uh, my flight school class, I started with 74 people. Uh, 12 of the originals graduated on schedule. Others, some got eliminated, some got set back. But uh, I was, I thought, you know, at the, I, I don't know when you went through, but the way they did it with us is DA would select what airplane you went to, what aircraft you went to. The Chinook transition was given to the TAC officer. We had one Chinook transition come to my class, and it was given to the TAC officer to decide who was going to get it. So he walked out in front of the flight one day and he said, how many of you have Chinook experience? And there was about four of us raised our hands. And he said, y'all come to my office. So we went to his office and uh, he said, okay, what'd you do? Well, I had eight months in Chinooks and I worked on a maintenance team. We well, went through each one of us. I had the most experience. I'd been three years. And he looked at me and he said, you pass your instrument check ride, which was coming up. And you remember those. That was the one. That was, for me, that was the most fearful check ride we took in flight school. Because the bank would always come to you and go, we're here for you. We'll give you a loan. We're here. Anything you need, car, house, you just come see us. After you pass your instrument check ride. They build that apprehension up from day one back then. So, mm. like, oh. so uh, my TAC officer was a guy named O'Hare. And he said, you pass your instrument check ride. You got the Chinook transition. So I did. Bounced right out of flight school into Chinooks. Went straight from there to Korea as a W-1. I was the, I was, uh, uh, I became the first W-1 PIC in that unit since Vietnam, which uh, there was two of us, and we competed to see who was. So <clears throat> people that don't know, what's a PIC? Pilot in command. Pilot in command. And uh, so... It, but I was very fortunate in all the that Chinook unit that I got sent to. There was a, a large percentage of them were ex Vietnam guys, and their level of experience was unreal. Imagine, and yep. and I sucked that up like a sponge. I wanted to know everything that those guys could teach me, and uh, they they were very willing to teach. They were some of the best, most professional Army aviators that I ever dealt with. And uh, my hats to this day, my hats off to them for giving me the head start and building the foundation that I went forward with because that were, they were great guys. And, uh, you know, I was a warrant officer. So, you know, there's no saying there's no rank among warrant officers. Yeah, I was wondering why you were smiling when you're saying and, I was a warrant officer. And, <laughs> and, 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 and so. What's the big know, difference between warrant officer and commission officer? Well, warrant officers now are commissioned officers. They changed that right, right. Uh, while I was in. But back then, there were certain things that a warrant officer couldn't do that a commission officer could do. Whole command, administer uniform, code of military justice, punishments. You couldn't do that as a warrant officer. You basically were expected to be an expert in your field, and my field was aviation. 
and uh, I worked hard to do that. But later, I don't know, maybe eight to ten years later, the military, the Army, commissioned warrant officers. So at that point, yeah, warrants could W-2, do it. right? A CW two, I think, is where they become commissioned. Uh, back then, no. Back then, they didn't even have that gateway mm. to commission when I was in there. They passed that later, eight to ten years after I'd been a warrant. I think I was a W three when they I had to do the commissioning thing. And uh, little prejudice here. That's just the way that the army gets cheap labor. You know, you can do everything that that major or captain, lieutenant can do now, but you don't get paid as much. But yeah, oh yeah, you're supposed to be an expert in your airplane and know that thing inside and out. Not only that, you have the same responsibility and probably not the same authority, even though it might say on paper, but, yeah, but you not don't really. have the same. You know that. You were a warrant. You know right. that too. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, you know, so I did the Chinook for five years. And uh, became an instructor in them. I was a uh, night vision goggle instructor pilot. I used to have a lot of hair and be better looking before those days, but the Army had come out with, and you got to remember, this isn't too long after Desert One and the Iranian deal and where they took our people and kept them for 400 plus days. The, uh, the Army decided that having 10% of your people night vision goggle qualified wasn't good enough. So they changed the procedure. This was in like, uh, I finished flight school in 83. This was about 85 where they came down and said, nope, 90% of the unit needs to be night vision goggle qualified. Two years, I did nothing but night vision goggle qualifications. I used to tell the guys they'd get in there and, you know, first time they'd really been exposed to any night vision goggle stuff since the little small thing we got in flight school and uh i used to tell them say okay my job is to keep you from killing us until you learn how to do this and uh, a lot of them tried pretty hard but you know i hung on and managed to escape it but uh, five years of that and a uh, good friend of mine i was getting ready to go back to college i had one year left to do so i was going to go do that finish it up get my degree was you still on them Active duty at the time? Yeah, okay. I was. They had a program called degree completion. Well, because I had the old GI Bill, they said they would give me time for degree completion if I would use my old GI Bill, which that's fine. I, you know, I lived on Fort Campbell and I went to college. Well, before I left, as I was going out the door, one really good friend of mine that I flew Chinooks with, he came to me and he said, let's put in for fixed wing. Well, the way the, that worked in the Army then was warrant officers, usually between 800 and 1,000 a year, would put in for fixed wing airplanes. <clears throat> I didn't really want to do it because I really like, I was flying the D model Chinooks and I, I loved Chinooks. I loved flying them. I knew them because I'd worked on them. I, knew, I loved the mission because it was so diverse. You know, I'm jumping paratroopers one day and bringing the Rangers in a rubber boat inside, landing in the water the next day. It was really diverse mission. I, I liked that. But my buddy, he convinced me, he said, nah, man, come on. You know, they're not going to accept you. Just go ahead and go ahead and put it. We'll go put in for it. And my com company commander, he laughed. He said, you're a, you're a CH-47D night vision goggle instructor pilot. That's, a lady, that's the newest aircraft in the Army inventory. He said, they're not going to let you out of that to go to fixed wing. I said, well, I really don't want to go. He laughed. He filled. He signed the paperwork. We sent it off. Six months into degree completion, he calls me and he says, "I guess you get the last laugh." <laughs> I'd forgotten about it. Honestly, mm -hmm. I said, "What do you mean?" He said, "You got picked up for fixed wing." I said, "You got to be kidding me!" And I asked him about my friend. What about Paul? He didn't get it. He wanted it, but here I I get it, and I really didn't want it. So I end up going to a military intelligence unit. To, quickly deploying down to uh, Honduras where we were doing Reagan's thing. And well, hold on a minute. <clears throat> what, the whole fixed wing, how how long was that course? I mean, did you stay at Campbell? How no, no, no. I had to go to Rucker for the fixed wing course. Okay. Uh, That's you, probably just like a quick transition. For, it, it was... About two or three months, I guess? Yeah, it was about two or three months total. You went down and you flew a, a small single engine for a while. 
and uh, with an instructor, of course. And then they transitioned you over to twin engine. You flew that for a while. And uh, then they put you in another single engine. You went out and did spin training and all that kind of stuff. I think the whole thing took 10 or 12 uh, weeks total. And then you get your first assignment. My first assignment was a military intelligence unit down in the southeast. And I showed up and got my family settled and packed my bag and got sent TDY down to Honduras, where we were doing, we were exploiting certain things against certain countries down there in support of Reagan's agendas. And I uh, did that. The airplane, the airplane that I got put in, no autopilot. I mean, Chinook didn't have a really three-axis autopilot, but it, it was pretty stable. You didn't constantly have to work with it. I, I guess where I'm going with that is the airplane that I got put into made Chinook look like the Waldorf Astoria. Right. And so, and and we were flying at uh, altitudes that mandated oxygen because the airplanes weren't pressurized. So we'd have to pre-breathe, carry that thing to the airplane, hook up to the air oxygen, so go out and fly for four, four and a half hours, <laughs> suck it on a hose. Mm. And uh, so did that for a while and, and became an instructor in those. And uh, then the Army, uh, coming out of that unit, the Army was fielding a, another aircraft system. It was a four-engine turboprop with counter-drug application. And it had been requested by Southcom in Panama. It was the first four-engine aircraft the Army had had since the Army Air Corps. And so there was a lot of pressure that the Air Force didn't want it to happen. And so everybody that they picked to fill that unit, to make that unit, and we did, it was a stand-up, was handpicked. <clears throat> so can I ask, let me ask a question. Why would the Air Force not want that to happen? I mean, I know the answer, but I want you to, I want to hear you say it. <laughs> okay. Is this where I take off the, the tactful uh, way? Because if Well, the Air Force has an, uh, has an air mission, and if somebody else picks that mission up, then that interferes with what they're, what they're doing and the money that they get. That's, I mean, a, brief, that, that's, that's a brief that's a very synopsis. Base, right. That's a brief synopsis that uh, is very courteous on your part well hey i'm trying to be courteous and uh the uh the they didn't want the army to have it because oh army pilots or helicopter pilots they, they should be even flying airplanes right. well they forget it was the army air corps before it was the u.s air force and uh, army pilots did a pretty doggone good job and uh, but anyway we were handpicked we went on we fielded the system uh did very very well we took it we deployed it to uh Panama, and we were very, very effective with it. And uh, then coming out of that, I knew that was going to be my last assignment. Uh, that was my plan, was that was going to be my next one after that was going to be my retirement. How many years did you have in, at that time? I had about 18 total. So uh, I called my career manager. I said, where's my next assignment? And I, she said, what do you want? Because I was, you know, I was W-4 by this time. And uh, no, I wasn't. I was still a senior CW-3. And uh, she said, what do you want? Where do you want to go? And I said, I would really like to go to the Force Comm Flight Detachment in Atlanta, Georgia. Because my aspirations after retirement was to go to work for Tennessee Valley Authority and fly a small helicopter and inspect power lines. That was it. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to retire. I wanted to land my little helicopter by a Hardee's every now and then and walk in and, you know, and, <laughs> and uh, it didn't quite work out like that. She said, no, I can't put you there. You're an instructor pilot. I got to put you where I can use your instructor pilot. I said, well, I'm also a school trained safety officer. Put me there. And she said, uh, no, nah, they already got one. Okay, obviously you asked me, but you're going to put me, you know, the oh, yeah, but you're happened. going to put me where you need, where do you want me to go? And she said, I want to put you at Fort Belvoir in Washington, D.C. And I was like, oh, hell no. I don't want anywhere near Washington, D.C. Well, did, you, well, did you ask what you were going to be doing? 
Yeah, I was going to be an instructor. Well, I know, but where at? Fort Belvoir at, at uh, Davidson Army Airfield. Mm -hmm. I was going to be flying C-12s, flying, which is King Airs. Yeah, but what did you end up flying? Yeah. I, I, I'll let you tell a story. Did I end up flying? <laughs> Uh, well, I'll, well, I'll let you go. I know where this is going, but I just want to. I, I ended. I told her. I said, "No, if you're going to send me to Washington, don't send me to Belvoir. Send me to Andrews. Put me in the jet detachment." First thing out of her mouth was, uh, "Oh no, I could." Oh wait a minute, you got a very very competitive record. I said, "I'll call you tomorrow." So okay, she calls me back and tells me, "You're going to Andrews Air Force Base to the Army's only." Back then, Army's one of only two jet detachments that the Army had. Right. Only Army flying jets. Oh, that's another thing Air Force didn't want. Yeah, you better not put that Army uniform on. Oh, uh, no. <laughs> so I ended up going to Andrews, uh, flew Lear jets there, uh, for, became an instructor in those. For the first year, that's all I did, instructed in the, the Lear. Well, why was you flying jets for the Army? Why? Yeah, I mean, who was VIP you flying? VIP support. VIP. VIP support. What kind of VIP like army VIPs or just congressmen, senators, uh, vice president, secretaries of the Air Force, secretaries of the Army, uh, big, we call them big wigs, you know, the, the big, the politicians. That's another thing. Boy, you talk about change. I watched out my front windshield many times sitting there in the front waiting on them to board. I watched the glad handing and the bat the back padding and ah, that's the greatest thing then they'd get on that airplane door would close that guy's an asshole oh <laughs> lord the difference is the personality shifts that jerk i can't stand that sob you know it's like yeah. and and there was a here's i gotta be careful here there was a female that was married to a pretty important person and uh, he was the one that actually held the position. And she wanted things like, she was campaigning around for things like warning, level, warning labels on CDs and video games. Woman had a gutter mouth. She cussed worse. She, I've, I've watched her cuss out a steward, and it, it, it embarrassed a Navy guy, the language she was using. And so I, I watched all in the, the hypocrisy. And it was like, I get it. I get it. And so that just feeds into what we were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, they don't care about this country. I saw a $100,000 modification have to be done to the 757s when they first arrived at, at Andrews. Why? Because a president's wife's hips brushed the door when they went into the VIP restroom. Go back and look. Go back and see if the 757s did come to Andrews, the first ones, and then have to go right back to Boeing to have modifications done for that. Wow. So, you know, I, I saw all that. But so I did the, <clears throat> the Andrews Air Force Base thing, and I flew Gulf Streams. I flew some very, very nice airplanes. I got some very, very nice missions. That was the whole time you were active duty? Yeah, that okay. was all active duty stuff. And when I left there, uh, that's when I left and went to Coca-Cola. And when I retired. And so I thought that was it. I had 20. Did you have that lined up before you retired or was it? Yeah. That... Well, I lined it up the last year okay. before I retired. I got hired like six months to go. And, uh, well, before we go there, I saw some pictures of you when you were, can you give any names of the guys that you were flying that last year in DC? In DC? Mm -hmm. Well, the pause tells you how much of an impression they made on me, doesn't it? <laughs> right. uh, well, you, you ain't got to go. No, it, I, I just I, saw I, some I, pictures that, you know, I mean, we've known each other for a while, so I saw some pictures well, way back it, when. It, like in Chinooks, I flew H.W. Bush, you know, several times. Uh, it, he was always very nice. Because you're a flight. VIP with Chinooks also. Uh, well, we got tasked a couple times. We supported him when he came down for the inauguration I believe it was the Honduran president, and I had to go over to Guatemala City okay. and evacuate him in the event things went south. Gotcha. So I met him there, and then later we flew him. We The Secret Service liked us because we followed instructions well. I was with the 101st Airborne Division then, and so 
from time to time, there would be a request to come down through the chain of command to support him somewhere else. Like I flew him into the, into the, uh, we flew him into the uh, opening ceremonies of the Pan Am Games, which was at, at that year, it was in the Indianapolis 500 track. So I, I got to fly some of those kind of guys around from time to time. And, uh, you know, I've, uh, through the years, I've got to fly in a number of celebrities. Well, we'll get there. People you'd recognize. Yeah, let's, let's go to the Coke thing first before we go. Okay. Coca-Cola. I went to Coca-Cola. and uh, So I, I would imagine before you got out, flying all those senators and their, you know all those big wigs. Shelby. You, uh, there's a name that you'd remember. Man, Richard Shelby. Hill. He was the uh, senator from uh, Alabama mm -hmm. at the time. And uh, the flight attendant went up, went back and told him, said, yeah, your pilot's from Alabama. He was, his attitude was basically, I don't give a shit. <laughs> yeah. so, well, why would so, he? You know? so it's like, okay. Not like you're right, representing yeah. the state or anything. Uh, well, you know? I do vote, by the way. I do vote. <laughs> Not that it means much, but uh, right. I do vote. But, yeah, you know, I flew him. I flew a lot of senators and, and representatives and, and, and also uh, uh, cabinet members. You know, for a lot of those people. Well, my question was going to be, since you're flying all those guys, did that lead to the Coke thing afterwards, or was that something that you were working totally separate? Uh, I don't think it was who I flew that led to the Coke thing. I think it was what I was flying aircraft-wise. Okay. Gotcha. Because the aircraft that I was flying at Andrews was the exact same aircraft that they had at Coca-Cola. Mm -hmm. And the fact that I was an instructor pilot in them and all that, and I had a military background, and uh, I think that – had a lot to do with me going to Coca-Cola. Sure. And uh, the uh, – What was that interview like? Thanks for coming, start Monday? <laughs> no. Oh, no, no, no. It was uh, – it was a very – it wasn't near as formalized as I would have expected from Coca-Cola. Since then, I know people that work at Coca-Cola, worked – I don't want to bring any heat on somebody. So I'm just thinking, I don't give a shit. <laughs> My wife worked for Coca-Cola for, can be a, for 30, about 35 years. Yeah. And uh, I, I didn't know her when I went to work for Coca-Cola. But uh, the process is much, hiring process, to go back to what you asked, the hiring process now is much more formalized than it was back then. It was pretty flippant. I went down and talked to a senior vice president that was head of the aviation department. He asked me a few questions, and, and, and then I had to go in front of three people, and they asked me questions. And I'll give you an example. Uh, this one, this one kind of tickled me. Um, they're reading. I'm on the other side of the table, and they're reading their stuff. Have you ever had to work uh, on uh, using team concepts? <laughs> and I'm like, do you not see my resume? I just spent 22 years in the Army. Right. Uh, you know, there is some team play there from time to time. But I said, oh, yeah, I have. And they asked me, and, of course, give me an example. And, well, we had to develop this, or we had to develop that, or we had to go in and do something. Well, they probably had no... No military experience at no, all no. to be able to ask something like no, that. No, they yeah. didn't. So I explained all that. And then the question was, I'll never forget, well, did you have anybody that was you considered troublesome on that team? That, and, and if so, how did you handle them? So, you know, yeah, you go, these generic HR questions. So I, I weighed through all that. And, and so after that, then uh, I went back to, I was still at Andrews. So I went back to Andrews and was flying. And I got another thing where they wanted they invited me back down and wanted me to go to the aviation department. And I did. And I went out there and the chief pilot sat down across the desk from me and he pulled out a piece of paper and he wrote a number down on it and turned it upside down, slid it across the table like you see in TV shows and, and said, uh, would you come to work for us for that? And I was like, so I grabbed the piece of paper and picked it up and compared to my military salary. He was good. And I was like, Oh, yeah, I think we can work with this. You know, that great, like I, I've told you before, that worked great till I got my first paycheck mm. and realized how much harder you get hit for taxes as a civilian versus in the military. Uh, and you're not making that kind of money in the military, so it doesn't have the impact on you. That Right. So, 
but I, I, uh, went to work for them. I, did, I went through that process and went to work for them for five years. And after I'd been there about two years, I realized that, uh, this wasn't as I hoped it to be my retirement job. The people we flew, the higher levels, uh, CEOs, Mark, uh, chief operating officers, chief marketing officers, uh, CFOs, chief financial officer, very good people, very nice and uh, easy to get along with. The equipment we flew was top of the line. The people that I worked with within the aviation department, 90% of them were top of the line. I would, if I start my own company, I'd put them to work tomorrow. And I was there for two years and politics started to enter into things. And middle level management was terrible. Uh, the aviation department fell under security. Well, people that are driven to aviation for the most part, they're usually fairly bright and a lot of them are type A personalities. That doesn't go well with the management style that's used for most security people. It's different. You have to manage based on your personnel. They couldn't seem to ever grasp that concept, and they would try to manage everybody the same. And after two years, I was like, mm, this is not it. And it got to the point, the, the fifth year, the last year I was there, I would start, I'd leave my house, and I was in the best of moods. By the time I drove through the gate, I was ready to eat glass. I, I was just in just piss poor mood. Mm. And uh, I was like, this is no way to live. So the combination of things there at the end, I left Coke. And uh, uh, stayed long enough, I got vested. Got a little Coca-Cola check comes in every month. But it's kind of funny. Yeah. But uh, and, and I met my wife. And uh, that's the best thing that happened to me. Not just at Coke, but pretty much period. Right. Because she keeps me very grounded, very stable. Uh, she's my second wife, and after the first, I swore up and down there wouldn't be another one. And but uh, we were. So you met her at Coke. I met her at Coke. Yeah, she came to the aviation department about the end of the second year I was there. Uh, she came there with another lady, and they job shared. Julie was raising two small kids. She was married. Thought she was happily married. Things happened in her marriage later that changed that. And uh, she and I, it's, it's kind of funny. There were five, five women in the aviation department. I was one of the only single pilots. And uh, I, I was like, I was old enough to realize, don't mess with any of them. Right. You leave them all alone because you make one mad, they all going to be mad at sure. you. So I would do things. When I was on a trip, I'd bring all of them back something and put it and let y'all fight over it. Y'all decide what you want to do with this. But Because they were good to work with. They were professional, but I didn't want to make any of them mad. And, and so uh, later when uh, Julie's life or her marriage, went, not her life, but I'm sure her life to a degree, but her marriage went south. And uh, after that was direction was established, uh, she and I started seeing each other a little bit. And I was like, and she, at work, she was like, I was like, nobody's this nice. Nobody's this nice. And it was like, because every day she was the same. And I was like, no, no, no. And, uh, so when it, all that transpired, and then when we got to the point that we started dating, uh, I was like, okay, when's the other shoe going to fall? Right. When's it going to fall? <laughs> it's going to happen. When? How long? And uh, we dated our red gauge for five years. And that other foot, that other shoe never dropped. And I went to myself, I said, well, if I'm ever going to consider getting married again, I don't think I can beat this. And uh, that's what I thought back then, and I still think it to this day. Mm. Uh, and we've been married over, wasn't quick with that, so she'd probably look at me with a stink eye. But yeah, well, we've been yeah. married, we've been together over 20 years. 
and uh, I'm still waiting on the shoe to fall. It hadn't. Probably but, not going to. I uh, probably not. And uh, so I, I hit a home run there, probably more than I deserved. I'd agree with that. And, <laughs> thanks, Bill. <laughs> thanks, brother, my friend. Uh, but uh, so, you know, I left Coke, and then uh, I got opportunity to uh, run an aviation department in Atlanta. I did that for a guy for several years. And this is some of the stories I'm looking forward to. <laughs> well, I, I, they were home builders. And uh, very nice people. Uh, the, the department was privately owned. And so I I did that for a number of years. And then in 08, you know, the housing market and the economy started taking hits. And they, they got hit hard. We had to shut that down. And uh, so I got opportunity to go to work for NetJet, which is the airline for the rich and famous. It's a fractional ownership of aircraft. And flew a lot of people. I had to sign NDAs, and so there are a lot of names I can't say. There was some interesting things, like, you know, uh, I, one thing, I, I don't mind sharing this one, and I, I hope he wouldn't be angry over it, but uh, when Arnold Schwarzenegger, he owned a section of one of the airplanes, and he was governor of California, he used his private use of the, uh, even for his job, he used his share of NetJet, of the aircraft, and didn't charge it back to the state of California. He footed the bill. Well, it was funny because the first time I flew him, he shows up with the state troopers. He's sitting in the front right seat, and he's working. And he, they pull up. He gets out of the front right seat. He's got his, he got his shirt, long sleeve rolled up, about halfway up his forearms, and uh, he's got a cigar unlit hanging out the corner of his mouth. And he comes up the steps of the airplane, he takes the cigar out of his mouth, and he looks up at the cockpit, and he's, hello. <laughs> well, hello, sir. He turns and he walks to the back. Don't hear a, do the flight, don't hear a word out of him. He comes back as he's getting off, still got the cigar, still not lit. Thank you. And he goes away. And that was it. You know, it's like really nice guy. Flew him several times. Very nice guy. There were some people I flew. There was one woman, and I won't mention her name because I'd get in trouble. But everybody thinks she's kind of neat. She's kind of special. The meanest woman I ever met in my life. And uh, and uh, she's, uh, her staff was so afraid of her that they wouldn't even get up out of their seats till she had got up and walked to the front of the airplane. Well, you can't say name, but can you say the industry? Like musical industry? Is she a lot of hospitality. Uh, not, uh, not hospitality. She produces a lot of home-type products. Yep. And uh, she's got some relationships that people would look at and go, well, that's an unusual relationship. But uh, she was, she was very, could be very mean. There was another, there was a, there's a lady that I picked up in Rome, one of my last flights with NetJet, and uh, transported her from Rome to Nashville, Tennessee. Her husband is a well country, country western singer. Right. I thought it was so neat. We pulled into the ramp with the airplane like 4.15 in the morning, Nashville time. He's there in the pickup truck to pick her up. I thought that's pretty cool. Yeah. You know, he could have sent limos or whatever. No, he was there to pick her up. And on that note, there was another one. And I, I hope I don't get in trouble for this, but I'm going to pretty much tell this one like it is. <laughs> Here we go. I, I, I picked up uh, two people and their wives in the Greek islands. One of them is a, a rock and roll singer. And uh, try not to get in trouble. Comes out of the, kind of the Boston area in, uh, in, in Philly. And uh, things about the USAA, sometimes the USAA. And the other is a very, very, very well-known actor. 
uh, I think uh, mm, what was the movie when they were looking for Private Ryan? Mm. Uh, he's 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 an A-list actor. So I picked him up in the Greek Islands, and my duty day had started in Paris. And I'm flying back. We had to stop in Shannon, Ireland for fuel and crew change. I was getting off. Well, these two individuals who's probably got more money than Jimmy Carter had peanuts decide that they want to go in the duty-free shop. Well, Shannon, Ireland is a refuel stop for charter aircraft taking our soldiers to Iraq and Afghanistan then. And there was two aircraft of soldiers there waiting on the refuel, and they were off the airplane in the terminal. Well, these two individuals go into uh, uh, the duty-free shop, and they get spotted, all these soldiers. Well, both of these individuals, I think, have, uh, if you had to categorize them, liberal, conservative, they're, they're fairly liberal, and uh, they were had made statements that were not in support of our actions overseas. And so I'm thinking this, when I saw, saw and all this stuff starting to transpire, I thought, well, this is not setting up to be a good thing. The Gulf Stream that they were on got refueled and ready to go. But those two individuals, their wives stayed on the airplane. But those two individuals stayed in the duty-free shop and signed autographs and took pictures until those soldiers got back on the airplanes and went to Iraq and Afghanistan. Mm. I mean, a long time. And I was, I didn't like these two guys because of their public policies. And me being conservative and being reared by a conservative army officer, I was, you know, it's like, no, you don't talk bad about our country. You don't do that. You don't do but then when that event occurred, I thought, how cool. They don't support the war, but they don't blame the warrior. How cool is that? No. You know, to me, that really impressed me about mm -hmm. those two. And even today, do I support their politics? No, I don't. But they put these people above their politics, which that impressed the hell out of me. And later, yeah, they, no they got back on the airplane, went, went on. Yeah, they, but no they could have got any time. They could have gone out there and got on the airplane and left. Yeah, no cameras there, no, no. publicists. No, no. no. And, and there's probably very few people know that story. I guarantee you all those GIs that were on those two airplanes know it. Yeah. You know, but uh, it, it goes back to, once again, talk about judging a book by its cover. Uh, my dad was in the Army and went to Vietnam. And I don't remember what if it was while he was in Vietnam or shortly thereafter, Muhammad Ali declared himself to be a conscientious protector. And uh, at the time, I was a young kid, and I thought, put him in jail. Put his ass in jail. You know, if he won't go support our country, put him in jail. But he said, you know, it, the reasons that he gave for not going, to me, it's like, that's bullshit. That's bullshit. You know, he needs to go just like anybody else. I mean, Elvis Presley joined the Army and went overseas. He's no better. <clears throat> Years later, when I was at Coca-Cola, I had a flight, and I flew Muhammad Ali. And first off, he shows up, and he's he had Parkinson's, and he was very soft-spoken, but he was just as nice as could be. And he's wanting to, he loved to entertain. He loved magic. He, you know, as he's getting on the airplane or waiting to get on, he'd do magic stuff, you know, and uh, and entertain people. And uh, I, I, I thought about it more after I met him, and I thought, you know, if he had flipped back the other way after he refused to go, but he didn't. Mm -hmm. He stuck with that same philosophy and his same thoughts and ideology for the rest of his life. And I thought, you know, he gave up some of the most prime years of his career for a belief. Mm -hmm. Whether I support the belief or not, 
that that impressed me. And uh, I was flying him. Uh, two, two things that stuck out to me about flying him. A lot of stuff did, but two things in particular. One, flight engine, flight attendant comes up to me, and this was a former Air Force One flight attendant, extremely good. And uh, he said, man, he's back there reading the Bible. And he said, any Muslim? And I said, yeah. And he said, that doesn't make sense. So, you know, several hours and after a while, the flight attendant comes back up and said, I asked you, why are you reading? The, I thought you were Muslim, sir. Why are you reading the Bible? And Ali looked at him and said, well, he said, I've read the Bible cover to cover six times. And he said, how can you identify and speak with other people without truly understanding their beliefs? <laughs> I was like, wow. Yeah. Wow. That's impressive. Mm -hmm. And the other one was the other thing he did, which was kind of cool. This wasn't as impressive, but it's kind of cool. He, uh, we weren't allowed to ask if we could have pictures taken with him. That was against policy. His, after we landed, his, uh, his aide manager comes and says, would you guys like to have your picture taken with Mom Ali? Absolutely. So we go over there and we do the thing, standing side by side and the hands on the shoulders. And then he's, he's, he's sitting there, that head nodding, you know, and he, he looks at me and he goes. <laughs> so I'm like, uh-oh. So I go over to him. He poses me. Do you remember the Rocky, the first Rocky mm -hmm. movie where at the end, Sylvester uh, Creed and Balboa are swinging at each other and right. they stop, right. stop the movie right there. Yep, for part two. He posed me like that. Yeah. And then he gets on the other side. And so I've got this picture with me and him in boxing stances and I'm throwing a right hand towards his head and he's throwing one towards mine. Yeah. I've got that picture mm -hmm. and to me, that's like, that's, yeah. that's gold. <laughs> I, I look, but the thing that, that I, when I look at the picture, I think that's great. I flew him. I met him. That's cool. But I look at the picture and you can see the size of my fist. It's not big, but it's not little. But in that picture, his fist is about that much bigger yeah. than mine. And I kept thinking, man, can you imagine in his prime getting hit by that thing as fast as he could? Sledgehammer. But, yeah, it's yeah. unbelievable. Mm. But super nice guy. Wherever we took him, I flew him three or four times. Wherever we took him, he always drew a crowd. And he always was very hospitable to the crowd. And uh, I remember I landed him up in Kentucky one night, late at night, and there was a woman there. And she was standing by the gate. I don't know how in the world she knew we were coming in. But he walked by and she said, Mr. Ali, she said, I have Parkinson's too. And I won't, just want you to know that we can live with these things. And he stopped and hugged her. And I was like, this is a very compassionate guy. Yeah. yeah. yeah and uh, he impressed me yeah. very much. But uh, anyway, so that's how you, yeah, you may judge somebody. But maybe you don't know the whole story. Sure. Maybe no, there's don't. more to it. And so maybe Usually a lot more to it. Maybe you might want to explore a little bit. And uh, so, well, so we I, know, I, 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 I met some good people flying for them. Well, one of the flights people. I want to hear about is <laughs> when you used to give your briefs to the passengers about <laughs> why are you smiling? You know, <laughs> it was a guy. Well, it was a guy. and I'm not, I'm not going to say any names on this one. That would get me in deep trouble. Let's just say she's a very, very, very attractive, well-shaped female singer. And uh, we were getting ready to take off, and the guy that I was flying with, he was kind of funny. He said, uh, he knew. He said, go back and, and brief her on the weather. Well, I go to the back of the airplane, and I open the door, and she's standing there and a uh, uh, pretty – well, a long state of undress. And uh, I was like, oh, I'm sorry. And I went to shut the door. And she said, oh, no, come on, come on, come on. What What you got? What you got? Well, her aides are helping her change clothes. And I'm trying to be just as professional as I can, but <laughs> she was a very beautiful woman. Mm. And, uh, you know, well, the weather is going to be really hot. <laughs> <laughs> so, but uh, that was, and then I came after I briefed her. 
I went back up and I sat down in the cockpit. The other pilot looks at me and he goes, pretty nice, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you knew? He said, oh, yeah, ever flight, ever flight. Yeah. But uh, so that was a flying for them was a very unique experience. You know, it's, I met a lot of, uh, you know, some of the rich and famous are very nice. Some of them are total assholes. Yeah. Uh, there was one guy in particular that I'll never forget uh, that heavily involved with uh, women's cosmetics. He's a jerk. He's a jerk. Wouldn't even take his aisle, his feet out of the aisle so the flight attendant could walk by. And uh, knowing she was trying to get by. And, and, you know, you just see, you see, you really get a chance to flying politicians, flying the rich and famous. You, you really get a chance to, to see people behind the scenes and how they are. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and how you could, you picture what you see on television or what you read in a magazine, and you form this idea of how these people are. And then you meet them, and it just blows that idea all to hell. Yep. And it's like, maybe I'm a little shallow here. Maybe I should do a better job of evaluating people. Well, they always say careful of meeting your heroes, right? Yeah, you do. Yep. You do. So so anyway, I did that, flew for them, and uh, the economy was going to hit them too. So about that time, I got notified that uh, – uh, I was recall to the military. I'd been out 10 years. So I went back in and. Was that volunteer? I it guess, was. I guess everything's volunteer. It, it was uh, at the time. The guy uh, that called me uh, told me that he was so-and-so from Human Resource Command. I didn't even know what that was. He said, you probably knew it as purse com. I said, okay. And he explained things to me and. Uh, and told me if you volunteer and come back and give us two years, we'll reset your retired pay. And uh, so, I, knowing the army like I did, I asked him, "Can I get that in writing?" And he said, "It's already in writing, United States Code." So I said, "Okay." So I said, "Let me call you back." So I did, and I ran some numbers, and he was right. It it had a good effect on my retired pay if I gave him two years. And he also said, "Now it's voluntarily." About three months from now, it's probably not going to be voluntarily, voluntary. And uh, so I said, okay, well, I'd rather go in on my own terms. Mm -hmm. And I did. I went back, and uh, first place they sent me was Korea. And it's so funny because I had been flying the most modern Gulf Streams in the world. I mean, Gulf Stream is the Rolls Royce of corporate aircraft. And I went from there to the oldest RC-12 reconnaissance airplanes in the United States Army inventory. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, I sat down in the cockpit first time. I, I think that I said something like, I thought these were all in museums. But uh, anyway, we flew the DMZ of Korea very routinely uh, to monitor what was going on north of it. And that that kind of brings me to uh, something that if you really ever want to see a clear delineation of democracy and communism fly the DMZ of North Korea with North Korea, South Korea. We would fly east and west. Our tracks were usually east and west, back and forth. And uh, that's not classified. That's well known. But when you're up there and you're sitting up there at, you know, 15, 18, 20,000 feet, wherever you are, you look north and it's dark. I mean, it's darker than the inside of a cow. It's just no, no, no city lights, no car lights, no fires, nothing. It's just dark. And you look to your look back down to the south, South Korea. It's lit up like Disney World. Mm. And I was like, boy, if it it can't be any more clear, right. you know. So. But uh, anyway, did that, and then from there, the Army decided they needed me to, we're going to send you back to Fort Rucker, Alabama, and you're going to do some stuff there, you know, and, and I, I did. And I, instead of two, I ended up staying three years and uh, got out. And uh, At this point, how much time did you have in the military? 
the second time you got out? 25. 25. So you had 25 years in the military and a whole lot of other experiences as civilian pilots doing different things, and then which led to a little bit of a contract work world. I mean, at what point – I mean, you don't have to say how old you are, but at what point do you say, hey, you know, I've done quite a bit already? Or are you at the point to where you're like – Hey, I'm still having fun. I don't care. You know, it's not a matter of uh, I'm tired of it. It's just I'm still having fun, so why would I quit? I mean, where are you at right now? Right now? Yeah. I've had enough stress in my life. Yeah. I'm ready to get rid of some of it. Mm. Uh, because when you're young, I don't think you feel, me personally, when I was younger, I didn't feel the stress as much. Uh, you know, we go into a hot LZ or something. It happens to the other guy. It doesn't happen to me. You know, you, I, 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 and I thought that I was good enough that I'm, I, I'm not worried about something happening to me. But as you get older, I think stress, cumulative stress, takes its toll on your body, your emotions, your mind, and your physicality. And I'm 70, and I've, I've reached the point where is it still fun? When I'm up there, the, right now I manage an airplane that can be flown single pilot. And uh, I'm involved with others that are dual pilot. But when I'm up there single pilot and the weather is beautiful and I'm flying along at, you know, 16, 18,000 feet and – very modern airplane. It's just as smooth as can be, and I'm looking, and it's just as clear as I can see. And yeah, I still enjoy that. No, yeah. but then the next day when I'm, <laughs> when I'm battling weather down to minimums and yeah. and and passengers that that uh, sometimes impose problems, then then it's like, you know, why, why am I? Why am I here? Why am I? Doing? I don't need to be here. Same thing I said when I was locked in that ship or container in in Africa for four and a half months. I had I measured it one day. I had eight and a half square feet other than my bed that was mine, and I would get out and you know, 120 degrees outside, and I'd put my feet on the ground. I got one day I said, "What the hell am I doing here?" <laughs> You know, I'm too old. I don't need to be here. I don't have to do this financially. Why am I doing this? And I believed in the mission. I, I believed in the country. I believed in making safe things, safe things safer for all of us. Yeah. And uh, and so there was job satisfaction with that. But mm -hmm. all the questioning that we talked about earlier that's kind of changed, you know. I don't look at things quite the same. I don't – what I'm being told I'm doing, I'm not necessarily ready to take that to the bank sometimes. It's like, really? Well, then how come this happened? Oh, well, that that's just, you know, you hear some excuse or they sugarcoat it. Mm. But uh, I don't know. Uh, I've had enough. Uh, I just – last week I was out – doing some flying test pilot flying for Lockheed. And I enjoyed it. I enjoyed doing that uh, because, you know, test flights, they give you test flight cards and you go out and you got, you know, maybe eight cars and okay, climb to this altitude, establish this speed, do this, do this, do this, do this, Roger, black and white, easy. And uh, you don't go do those kind of flights at marginal weather. And most of them, we do them out in the Southwest. So the weather's good. And uh, it, it's, it's a, that's enjoyable. I still enjoy doing that. But taking an airplane, flying it single pilot up into congested, ATC congested areas, and the weather's marginal, and I've got pastures in the back concerned about the weather. And I, mm -mm, mm -mm. I'm, uh uh. <laughs> it, it's enough. And I don't want to. Uh, it, it's time to turn it over. To Probably had some pretty scary times up there, too, I'd imagine. Yeah. I know one of those stories you're talking I've about been, the turbulence. Uh, uh, yeah, I've been very, very blessed. You know, I've had a lot of emergencies. I've had engine failures. I've had hydraulic lockups. Had a Chinook uh, 
that, I think that's probably, I feel like, the closest to ever being killed in an aircraft. I had a Chinook that had a full hydraulic lockup, and uh, which people will tell you that's, you're done. Mm. You can't move the controls when you have a full hydraulic lockup. It's not a, a Chinook, the blades weigh th over 300 pounds a piece. You're not moving all that stuff by hand. It's all hydraulically assisted. And uh, the design of the aircraft at the time, and I, do, I hope they've changed this, you had two hydraulic systems and uh, supposed to have built redundancy. Well, lo and behold, there was no relief valves in the system. So if you got something that blocked one of the systems, it became a rigid link, and that other system could not overcome that rigid link. And I was under night vision. I was at uh, instructor pilot. I was being evaluated for my annual ride by our standardization instructor pilot, senior instructor pilot. And uh, we had, uh, let's see, we had six people on the aircraft. And this was at Fort Campbell, Kentucky, 101st Airborne again. And uh, I was, if I, if I go to war again, that's who I want to go with because we trained well. Mm. And uh, it was always the motto, train like you fight. And we did. But we were out there and we were going, he was evaluating me and I was out to pick up a, an external load. Uh, we were going to pick up, we were on the way to pick up a 12,000 pound concrete block. And uh, we're about halfway there and Will says, and Will was a Vietnam guy. He had had two or three shot out from under him in Vietnam, uh, Chinooks. And those people that I spoke about highly that helped train me, my first assignment, he was one of them. Mm. And uh, so we're flying along. He's in the right seat. I'm in the left seat. We're flying along. And he goes, oh, we're going, where are you going? I said, I'm going to pick the 12,000 pound block. Oh, hell no. You're going, you, you're going to pick the 18,000 pound block up. I'm like, oh, shit. So he said, turn left. Let's go to training area eight or whatever it was. I said, so I started, I rolled into the turn. And when I rolled out, it, the controls felt very odd. It felt like they started to bind up. And, uh, and I noticed that the, when I would move the controls, the, the area of authority that I had seemed to keep shrinking. I couldn't move the controls quite as far. And I asked him, I said, Will, are you fucking with the controls? And, uh, and he said, no, why? Well, I looked out from under my goggles. You know, we had the, uh, I believe I, we were using sixes that night. I looked out from under my goggles over there, and he had his hands on his lap. And I knew him well enough to know, and the way he answered, he's telling the truth. And I said, because the controls are feeling very, very weird. Something's not right here. And, uh, and so I pulled back the cyclic, and I decreased power, and I started transitioning to a landing attitude. And uh, he said, what's it doing? I said, I'm, I'm running out of controls. I don't have any. And uh, we had a thing called power transfer unit, and Will, consummate professional. Uh, he said, okay, I'm turning on the power transfer units now. And he, the the – gauges for that system were back on the maintenance panel and he told the crew chief what kind of pressures do we have on this on the systems well meantime the aircraft slowing up transitioning nose coming up and uh he uh a flight engineer said we got three thousand in each system power transfer units turned on he said is that any better i said no i said no i said i've about i don't have i said i got about an inch and he says uh i'm going to get on the controls with you I said, and I, I remember this like it was yesterday. Things like that, you know, they stick out. And you remember every little detail. And when he said that, I said, please do. And he got on the controls. We bent the controls, and they wouldn't, at that point, they wouldn't move. They were locked up. I was about, by then, I was about, oh, 75 feet off the ground in a descent, slowing up, airspeed coming back. And it was so dark. It was, an, a, a, like I said, remember everything, 8% illuminate. night. And even with sixes, it's still pretty dark. Sure. And so as we're going down, and all I could see was whatever we're going into was uniform. I couldn't tell what it was, but the, the height was uniform. And I thought we were probably going into trees. And as we got closer to the ground, about the time, about 35 feet, we hit ground effect. And that nose started to come up a little more, and the airspeed came back. But now I, we can't move the controls. And... Uh, and I thought that was the first time when I thought to myself, this may be survivable. And, and uh, it, we came down, it was corn. 
Mm. It was an eight foot tall cornfield. And we hit, and that Chinook back wheels hit, and it bounced. And when it bounced up, Will reached up and pulled both engines offline. And so it kind of pitched forward and then came down on all and started going sideways. And I'm looking through these goggles, through those tubes, you know, with all that limited vision. And all I can see is these big blades with this static electricity coming off of them, just tearing corn up as we're sliding out through there. And he's, I'm standing on the brakes and it stopped. And we're sitting there and it's quiet. And in front of me, all I can hear on my, all you can hear on the interphone is, <laughs> and every master caution segment light in there is flashing. And the flight engineer, I hear him go, fire, fire, fire. And I'm like, oh shit. So I, it was total reaction on my part. I didn't think it through. And uh, I, because I'd worked on them, I knew them, man. I come out of my seat belt. I grabbed a fire extinguisher. I grabbed that NICAD powered little battery lantern and I went out that front door. I, I like a monkey. I'm up on top of the Chinook and don't ask me why I did that. I don't know. He didn't ever say where the fire was, but I'm up on top headed towards the engines. Well, I get back there. It wasn't a fire a smoke rolling off the tail cones because we had shut it down so abruptly. So I'm standing there and I got this little NICAD battle lantern. I've got the fire extinguisher and I hear footsteps behind me and I turn around. And it's everybody else that's on the crew is lined up behind me. And about that time, this battle lantern with its NICAD battery does its thing. <laughs> Total darkness. Mm. We're sitting in a cornfield, Fort Cam, Kentucky, like 2.30 in the morning, and total dark. Pitch dark. And one of the, the crew chief, he said, well, Mr. S Mr. Swank, and that was Will's last name, and uh, Will's passed since then, great man. Uh what, what should we do now? And Will, always the consummate professional, Will, I think the smartest thing that we could do is go downstairs, sit down, and compose ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so we did. And, and you know, the Army, you, you're familiar, the Army has a Broken Wing Award. Well, I got nominated, and we did, as a crew, we got nominated for a Broken Wing Award and, and approved. So the two-star general, Fort Cowan, Kentucky, was making the award. And uh, he, he said, uh, when he got to me, pinned the award on, he said, Chief, thank you so much. I appreciate what you did. I appreciate you saving my airplanes. I looked at him and I said, sir, it wasn't me. I said, we had six people on that aircraft that night. Five of them had pregnant wives, which was true. Mm -hmm. I said, God said, no, nah, I ain't going to make enough. I ain't going to make that many orphans at one time. No. And he took that aircraft and set it down. Mm. Two days later, my son was born. Oh, wow. So. Pretty cool. Pretty good. Yeah. Pretty good. So, yeah, that one about got me. Uh, you know, fixed wing is much more forgiving. You, you have an engine failure in a fixed wing. You know, you got a lot more glide ratio than you do in a helicopter. Mm. And so it's, uh, I've had engine failures. I've had to shut engines down precautionary in flight and, you know, had a jet, had Lost all oil pressure. Had to shut it down. Take it into Colorado, or Denver, and uh, you know the passengers kind of freak out when you pull the engine offline intentionally. But yeah, you know, see that or blow it up. Right. You know, if you're getting old, <laughs> zero oil pressure. So I've had some of that. You know, you you like me, you more so than me. I think been in places where they just as soon shoot you as look at you. And, uh, you know, you come back with little dings in your aircraft from time to time. And, and uh, as you well know, we were down there on the tip of the spear more <laughs> than I was. And uh, I don't so, think anybody has participated at all whatsoever. has been, you can call it the tip. You know what I mean? I mean, there's not really. Well. I mean, if you're getting shot, it doesn't matter how much or where. It's still. It, <laughs> it's still it, that's, yeah. very, that's very true. But some people are put, in, put themselves in harm's way more than others. And uh, a lot of that's army is based on what aircraft you fly. Mm -hmm. uh, how expendable is that aircraft? You know, hey, that's an expensive aircraft. It's not as expendable. So we don't want to put it where it, we might lose it. You mm -hmm. know, you've seen it. I've seen it. And, uh, but. Uh, you got any hobbies? Since you're getting close to your uh, 
Yeah. The portrait. I'm, I'm a tinkerer. Tinkerer. I, I, my dad was able to fix anything. Yeah. Uh, he could have been an engineer. I mean, he was he, from welding to plumbing to electrical. And, and when I was a kid, uh, I can remember we had like an old 47 Plymouth or something that he tinkered with. And I was a little old bitty kid. And he would work under the hood of that old Plymouth and he would set me up between the radiator and the grill and tell me, watch, pay attention. A little kid, I'd start looking away. Next thing I know, hey, 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 uh, watch, you know. <laughs> so bottom line to that, it taught me a lot. I learned a lot of stuff from my dad. And, and so I like fixing things. I like building things, whether it's uh, putting a new basement in my, our new uh, bathroom in my basement to uh, cars, working on cars. I love that. I love, I've, I've reconditioned several cars in my life. Last one, a GT500 Shelby Mustang. And I enjoy doing that. Uh, and, it, and I think that goes a lot back to, I'm basically a mechanic at heart. Sure. And, <clears throat> and uh, so, yeah, I like to shoot. Uh, I've, I've recently got into reloading. And I'm having a good time. I'm learning a lot there. There's a lot to learn. Or <laughs> you, you mess up. You, yeah. Uh, what'd you do? <laughs> yeah, I messed up and put too much powder in that shell. You know, it's like, okay. So I'm enjoying that. Uh, not much of a fisherman. You know, I, we picked the wrong spot I, to I, live. I, I don't. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I don't have the patience for fishing. Yeah. I used to fish a little, quite a bit, and then I don't know when what happened, man, but. It was years and years and years later where I was like, yeah, let me start fishing a little bit here and there. I couldn't catch a thing. I don't care where I went. <laughs> and I would be like, man, I'm just not knowing the place or something. I would go with people who were familiar with the area and they were very good. And I go with them, not a damn thing was caught. So I just gave up. I'm like, man, something, you know, something's going on. There's like some that, war that's around. That's not me. fun fishing, <laughs> yeah. you know. That. Well, I don't mind, <clears throat> you know, kind of like chilling out. Who cares if you really catch anything? But at some point, I want to catch something. You yeah. Know? And then, yeah. and probably the past four or five times I've been out, it's just been, you know. That's not fun fishing. Yeah. So uh, I, I, don't I used to take anymore. my kids down to Panama. I had two little boys. I used to take them fishing. We'd, we'd fish for peacock bass. I mean, it wasn't unusual to go catch 40, 50 of them. And so then it's it's fun. Even though I didn't fish much then, I was too busy baiting hook and taking fish off hooks and untangling lines. And and no, Michael, that fish is not bigger than yours, you know, as, <laughs> right. as the two brothers went at it. But yeah. uh, but now, nah, if you're not catching anything, that's not fun. But uh, but hobbies, that's, that's pretty much it. I'll, mm -hmm. I'll take something that that needs fixed. Like I had a pontoon boat. I took it all down to the frame and rebuilt it back up. It's cause it's like, I enjoy doing that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Julie says, I like taking broken things and fixing them. Mm. And she's, she's applied that to people too, which if, if Everybody that's brings the case, broken stuff over to you, so be it. No, yeah. you know, so be it. If you can help somebody get back on their feet and, and, uh, that's yeah, what we sure, should be doing. Yeah, it makes yourself <clears throat> feel a lot better. Yeah. It, you know, I've battled depression quite a bit. And I've noticed the more I'm out doing stuff, and I'm not even really trying to get recognition for it. You know, I don't want them to say, hey, thank you so much. But, you know, what they really don't know is I'm really helping myself yes. than I am them. So when they say, you know, if I pay for somebody's meal or do something or, you know, send them money for whatever reason, you know, they think that, you know, I'm this great person. Well, no, no, I'm just, no. I'm, I'm being kind of selfish too. So, <laughs> you know, it's like I was at the Tennessee game mm -hmm. uh, with Alabama and I was walking the street and these young kids were selling donuts and pulling a wagon around with their mom and they, they were selling it for, you know, probably for their ball team or something. So I, I walked by them and Mr. You want, want to buy some donuts? No, nah, I don't want to buy any donuts. I don't want to walk around with a box of donuts on the way to the game right. and stuff. And, uh, and I said, why, why are you selling donuts? Well, we're raising money. We want to uh, sponsor our little league team, so and so and so and so. I said, "How much a box of donuts?" And he said, ten dollars." And I said, "Okay, well, let me ask you a question." And there was one kid; he was a pretty sharp kid. And I said, "Let me ask you a question. If if I give you ten dollars and I don't take the donuts, what are you going to do with that box of donuts? Going to eat them?" <laughs> and he goes, oh, no, sir. I'm going to sell them. 
And that way we got more money to go. I said, here, kid, here's $10, <laughs> you know, and, and I got tickled. It made it, I wasn't doing it for me, right. but it did make me feel, it yeah. gave me a good feeling sure. to do it. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, you know, I know I've been around you. You got that kind of heart. Mm. And uh, I think a lot of us that have been exposed to some of the things that we have, have that kind of heart. I was, I was a quick story. We were in Honduras back in the Contra Sandinista days. And we were on a bus. We had gone down to, uh, they, this is one of the rare times they let us come off that little base there and go down to the little nearby ville uh, to eat at, uh, we called it the Taco Chino restaurant which was tacos run by a Chinese guy. <laughs> and uh, so we went in and ate. We got back on the bus, and uh, these kids used to come up to the windows on the bus begging. I mean, these kids were ragamuffins. I mean, they're, they're nasty, clothes terrible. Well, there was like six or seven little boys, and uh, you could tell a couple of them were bullies. And kind of ran the, the crowd. And sit, standing in the back was probably about a seven or eight year old little girl. And they wouldn't let her get anywhere near the windows. And a friend of mine, Paul, same guy that we put in for fixed wing together, we're down there and he's sitting in the seat in front of me on the bus. And uh, we're watching this out the window and we're talking about it. And I said, Yeah, that poor little girl doesn't stand a chance. And Paul said, that's bullshit. That was his favorite. So he opens his window and uh, he points at the girl and he motions for her to come up there. And so she walks through the crowd and the boys, they, they, they don't want to make this man mad. So they let her come through there. Paul takes off his watch and gives it to her. And he looks at the little boys and he said, and he said, you and Spanish, so he was speaking English, but he made the point with his finger. He said, you and you, and pointed at the bullies. He said, you take that watch from her. <laughs> and uh, and so the little girl took the watch and took off. Mm. And I mean, here we are doing stuff that you may get killed the next day, but you got that heart. Yeah. You got that tender heart. And I guarantee you, you saw that yeah. in the military. Oh, and, yeah, and, absolutely. Uh, Guys that can be the hardest warriors you'd ever come across and aren't never show fear can be some of the softest people inside you'd ever meet. Sure. So yep. it goes back to judging the book. Absolutely. Judging the book. I'm going to take a break real quick, man, or unless you want to end it. Uh, you got anything? I'll tell you what, let's just take a real quick break and then uh, we'll come back. Okay. Mike, we're back from our little break. Um, had a lot of discussions. We were. Probably took more of a break than we should have. I should have got some of that stuff on video, but hey, there's always another time, right? I hope so. I, <laughs> I hope. hope you do come back too because, you know, this ain't going to be the first time we do this. Um, but one last question I wanted to ask you before we got out of here is, you know, you you know, you know, gave up the information yourself. I didn't ask you. You said you're 70, which I think you look absolutely fabulous at 70. Well, thank you. I mean, way <laughs> better than I'm ever going to look if I ever do make it to that, to that age. Uh, you'd be surprised. <laughs> you'd be surprised. But I was wondering, do, you know, being at that age and all the stuff that you've seen and done, I mean, is there anything that you could go back and change or anything you, you regret that you've done or you just happy with? Re regrets? I think we all have regrets. It's just how much do you affect, let those regrets affect you as you move forward in your life. Mm -hmm. I don't. Uh, you know, some people, well, you first married. Did you regret it? No, I don't. I learned a lot and I got two fantastic kids. Uh, so no, no regrets there. Uh, looking back, are there some things that I would have done differently with the knowledge that I have now? Yeah, absolutely. Um, one thing that I learned and I learned this late in life that if you don't like the way something works, your best opportunities to change it are from the inside, not from the outside. And like right now, I'm not happy with the direction of our government. And I'm not just talking about national level. I'm, I'm local, state. You know, I, I look at politicians and they all seem to be cut from the same cloth. 
And I don't necessarily think that that was a, for most of them, that's a good bolt of cloth. There are some, there are some good, but so I look back and I've wondered if I could have tailored my life in a way that I could have gotten into politics and been effective at it. And, uh, and maybe at least slowed things down going in the wrong direction mm. and maybe had an effect on steering them in the right direction on occasion. That's, that's something that I, I think about. And I, when my dad asked me and he said, I'd recommend you go to the military academy. And I said, I don't want to ever have anything to do with the military the rest of my life. Ate those words later. But uh, I look at, if I had gone to that military academy, it, my career track that I ended up on would have accelerated. It would have been faster. And if I had gone to, I, I, one, of the, uh, one of the best compliments I ever had from a, a commander I had, and he was a, uh, ended up a brigade commander, full colonel. And if he had stayed in, he'd have been a general officer because he was exceptionally bright and still is to this day. But he, he, uh, he's one of those that got tired of the, the bullshit. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, he made a statement to me one day because I had had to be the acting company commander for a period of time. And, he made the statement that, Mike, why did you not go commission from the beginning? You'd have made a great general officer. And I, I never looked at myself in that light. I never looked at myself as a pilot. I told you earlier, I thought of a mechanic. I want to be a mechanic. Sure, yeah. Well, then I ended up a pilot. Sometimes I think we short sell ourselves in what we can do. That's one thing the military did good for me, yeah. was it showed me I was capable of a lot more than I thought I was. I absolutely agree with that. And, and so, but looking back, I think if I'd have pursued that and, and had the, the, I had been fortunate enough to become a general officer in the U.S. Army, I would have been in a better position to affect change. And yeah, I, I've looked back. And another thing that I've learned, and this is selfish. Or even affect it to not change. Yes. In some cases. Yes. <laughs> you know, right? Or at least slow up the negative change. Right. Yep. And so I, I look at that and I'm like, mm, maybe I, uh, that's one thing that looking back on. And two, I think that uh, unfortunately, <clears throat> civilian companies seem to they seem to equate your military rank with where they should position you in their civilian structure. That is true, and uh, I I think they're missing the boat. Because there's a lot of people qualified, much more so than some of the people that they put in those higher level positions that are there simply because they happen to be a two-star general in the Marine Corps or a three-star general in the Air Force. It doesn't necessarily make them that good. And uh, so, but there is that tendency. And you and that's one of those you and I won't change. It's going to be like that. And so to get into that system, you got to play that game. And so that's one I, I, I look back and I go, maybe I should have become a commission guy and, and pursued it that way. Uh, well, I think you would have been pretty good because uh, some of the ones that I've had, I mean, that's what, you know, I don't, I don't want to be bashing the Army, but I was ready to get out when it was time to get out. Me too. Probably about two or three years before I even got out just to see – the changes that I was seeing, wait, even before then, you know, there were some things that happened. I'll probably talk about some, at some other point, but um, really changed my uh, outlook on what I was going to do for the rest of my life. You know, sure. um, I don't mind people having the choice of what I'm doing with my life. What I mean by that is having, you know, competent officers choosing what I'm going to be doing, where I'm going. Keyword, keyword. Competent. Right. And uh, 
hey, if stuff goes bad, you know, I'll, I'll deal with the consequences of it, whether it's sure whatever it is. But when you have known people, not just by me, but even higher rank than they are, knows what kind of people they are, what kind of leaders they are, and still allows them to do that job. Yeah. And just like turn a blind eye and still let it happen. Um, that's when I realized that I don't understand what's going on, but I'm not going to let you guys <laughs> yeah. affect my life anymore. So that's, that was one of my main reasons of getting out. Yep. I've, I've been there and competent leadership is the key. Yep. And a, a phrase that I, I developed through my years in the army <clears throat> and it's applicable to the civilian world as well is in the army, you can have leaders commanders they're not necessarily always the one in the same right the army through virtue of assignment and rank can make you a commander and they have a lot of leadership schools that they can send you to i think the best leaders that i ever come have come across they were born with a basic leadership trait sure. that they developed and if a person doesn't have that basic leadership trait, you're not going to develop it. Mm -hmm. And you may make it better, but you're not going to make him a dynamic leader. And uh, you know from being in the military what kind of person you were willing to follow into battle. And it's a leader. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily a commander. It's a leader. And that... Uh, I watched my dad in his military career, and I watched the way he took care of his troops and the way that most of them responded in kind. You always have one or two that won't, but uh, that's another. You want to get into another. The management theory in the military is, okay, discipline, let's take the shotgun, shoot everybody. <clears throat> my Mine's much different. It's the sniper rival approach. If I've got a problem child, take out the problem child. Don't punish everybody by taking away everybody's weekend pass. Mm -hmm. You know, no, for what? Peer pressure. Because now they can't exercise peer pressure because they'll get in trouble. Mm -hmm. You know, you and I went through peer pressure, blanket party. <laughs> right. You know, now, oh, I'm sure if I'm by, probably go to jail. Oh, yeah. For what we went through in basic training. Yeah, you get kicked out <clears> of the building. But, but, so... To get back to the question, things I'd do different. Yeah, that was it. I would, uh, I think I, I enjoyed playing when I was a kid. And I want to say taking things a little more seriously at a younger age. It would have probably been productive for me to have done that. Yeah, but is that really going to happen when but you're that young? But that's not me. Well, not and, only that, you know, what, what built you to who you are today was from having those times. A lot of it. You know what I mean? Yeah, a lot of it. An example, you know, going through the military, I didn't. You know, me and my wife didn't drink that much. We didn't go out and party. We had a young kid the whole time. And I'm not saying we didn't ever. There were some times, yes, I did. But for the most part, we we didn't really uh, go out and do much, you know, because we just felt a responsibility to be at the house. And, you know, if I was gone, which most of the time I was, you know, she was there to make sure that he had what he needed to do and whatever. Well, but the once I got out... <laughs> There's probably about a five-year period that me and her, we was like, let's have some fun. We had a lot. We of, haven't had, we had a let's lot have some of fun. fun. <clears throat> and two, I think, <clears throat> excuse me, similar to that for me is during those years when you have small kids and you're in the military. There's not much money to play with. Oh no, yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, so it's like you, your responsibility is to your children. Your responsibility is to your wife. Your responsibility is to your family. And so, yeah, could I go out drinking with the boys as much? No, I, I've told people when I went through flight school, it was oftentimes that I would hit payday with a dollar in my checking account. Mm -hmm. And honestly, and it was, you know, I think my enlisted soldier time, my first paycheck, $399 a month. So we didn't have the money to go out and well, let's go to the movie when well, we don't have the money. You know, it's like we go to the movie. Let's get some popcorn when we don't have the money. No. <clears throat> Sneak in a candy bar. Right. You know, so <laughs> that that that's goes back to a lot of what you said. But then too, your focus is different. No. And uh, you learn from those times, and you grow through them, and you develop your future based on what you learned. 
Dick Eating. I think so. <laughs> so, how do you like the place? I love it. Yeah, we call this the Ridge, <clears throat> and uh, this is the uh, <laughs> pickle tato. The what? what? Pickle tato or tata? T a t o. Pickle tata. That's what we're calling this little podcast. The pickle yeah. tata. Pickle tato. Yeah. Well, and, there's a good general named General Tata. Yeah. Well, so we're not really. I'm not really divulging why that is yet. But there's a reason for the name, and we might say it later. But anyway, the reason I'm telling you, you know, see if you like the place that we call the Ridge here, is that's why you see, and some of the other people I've had on here, we've had flies going around, and now that little stupid moth coming here is because we're basically outside for. It's a good place. Yeah. So if it's anybody a, at home is wondering why, <laughs> it's a, it's a why you nasty people have all these bugs flying around, well, it's kind of like outdoors a little bit. It actually kind of reflects your personality. <laughs> really? Is that good or bad? I like it. Yeah, I love it. Otherwise, you wouldn't be what I would call one of my friends. That's right. So, yeah. you know, we we all know we've left a series of acquaintances in the past. Yeah. But your friends, I don't know if you're like me, you can count your friends on probably two hands. I can, not even that many. One? Pretty much good friends. Yeah, well, that you know you can depend on? Yes. Very few. And here's, Very here, few. here's something I want to bring up, too. And I've said this before. To other people, probably not on here, but isn't it weird that people in the military that's been in the military, and this might be other industries too, I, I'm just not familiar with it, but I've noticed in the military, I mean, I haven't talked to you, well, before I talked to you the last time, which was about two years ago, maybe a year ago, before that, we hadn't talked for maybe four or five years. Right. But as soon as we got back to, I mean, it's not like, well, hey what, you, hey, what have you been doing? This, it, yeah. it was like, hey, you know, it was, it was like we started a conversation. You, you right back in where you were. The, the same, like <clears> the next day. Yeah. And a lot of people, you know, in the military are like that. It's not like you're, hey, why didn't you call me, man? Yeah, nah. No. I didn't know that. It's like <laughs> you start right where, where you left off at, and I think that's pretty cool. But as far as, like, your friends, um, yeah, you're absolutely correct. And why I'm so limited to my friends, because I've learned recently <laughs> that um, it's very – the people – how do I put this without? I've been burned by friends recently who I would have never thought of. And would ever do it. Would do something <clears throat> like that. And I tried to process it in my mind to where it wasn't intentional. But every time I think back of the situation, the conversations and blah, 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 there's just no way it wasn't intentional. And it was very, very, very hard for me to to grasp. grasp and... Um, you know, it kind of sent me in a decline, you know, a little bit there for a while because I'm like, you know, humanity isn't what I thought it was because I would never do something like that. And um, I'm sorry, Bill, but to me, that's a character flaw in somebody. It is, and, but I, I, and we've been pretty good. We're pretty good at judging characters. I thought I was. And, that, and but that's, every now and then we make a mistake. Yeah. And not many because when you get down to that many people, you know, you, you've evaluated them pretty well. Yeah. And when you find one of those screws you over or does something totally unexpected that's to your detriment, <clears throat> that quick. And there's no going back. That's me. You 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 do that to me? Julie says, Julie, my wife, she says, you kind of hold a grudge, don't you? <laughs> right. I say, you damn right I do. Yeah. Somebody screw me over and expect me to just, next time I see them, say, hey, man, how you doing? I haven't seen you, missed you. No, no it's like, fuck you. F you, yeah. you know? I mean, I'm going <clears throat> to sneeze here in a second, but. You know, there's a couple that, <laughs> not in the military, and there's some in the civilian world, too. Oh. That, uh, you know, they seem to think if they make you look bad, it'll make them look good. Yeah, in this case, it wasn't even had anybody else to do with anything. It was just something that was, they told me that I took their word for, and it just was not what they said. It was a lie? Yes, blatant. And, so, and the bad thing is, is like, this, I know, I know that they know me well enough that they know I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to figure it out. And they still did it. That's, that's the hard thing to kind of swallow. Like, I'm like, really? Yeah. Yeah, I didn't say nothing then because I didn't know, but you had to have known I'm going to find this out. You know what I mean? Sure. So, um, yeah, but they did it anyway. Yeah. And so that's one you go, God, I had him so wrong. Well, it, it's not, I'm not really even mad at that person. I know that sounds dumb. I'm just so disappointed. Yeah. 
not only in this, Especially but when you consider them your good friends and they pull yeah. that, it's like, it's a level of disappointment. And, and, and I think it's worse if it's a military friend and it's like, I would have never done that to you. Mm -hmm. and, and you, I trusted you. I really trusted you. And you did that. It's like, to me, it's like, fuck you. I'm done with you. Don't come around my house. Don't darken my door. There ain't no apology mm -hmm. because we ain't going back. But, and you know well, damn well, if they came to you and apologized and you said, okay, apology accepted, it'd never be the same. Oh, no. No. Somebody break that trust one time. Mm -hmm. I, I understand. Because we, we trust with our lives in the military. And so would you realize and think that you can trust this guy to that level and then they betray that trust? There ain't no fixing that. Mm. That's yeah. just me. Yeah. Like, like I was saying, I, I'm not mad at this person or people. There's actually been a couple of different things that's happened, but I'm more, I was more disappointed in myself than not recognizing it. And listen to other people. On one instance, some other person was telling me, what they thought was going on. I was like, no. and, and they were right. <laughs> so. Yeah, <clears throat> it happens. Yeah. It happens. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to do this. Yeah, I mean, and I really appreciate you coming out. I was looking forward to this. And I, hope I know I, it's a long hope I didn't trek say out here. To get you in trouble. Nah, I don't give a shit about that. What are they going to do? And uh, or me Fire in trouble. Me. <laughs> but I'm, I'm, I'm not worried about it. It's like at this point, my life's my life, and it's wow. always been pretty transparent. And, suspect it will be till I die. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, one last thing. I just had talked to my sons within the last few days. And uh, we were talking, and as they, as your, as your kids get older, you can have conversations with them at different levels. <clears throat> and uh, I expressed to mine both that uh, one of these days when I take my last and draw my last breath, I would like to go wherever I'm going to go from there, knowing that both of my sons have long, have found long-term happiness. And uh, that, to me, is probably at this stage in my life about the most important thing to me mm -hmm. uh, going into the future. And uh, But you know as well as I do, too, you can't force that can do is advise and we do as parents we advise and uh but regrets no really regrets yeah. things i've done differently on hindsight right a few yep a few <laughs> and uh and i don't think that's over oh no, i think it's never i think i will still encounter things in for a while that i look back and go yeah, I should have done that differently. Uh, yeah, pretty much every day life. for me, man. So. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> a lot of times, yeah. It's yeah. a daily occurrence. Well, hey, man, let's jump off here. Uh, I know Carrie's dying to wait and talk to you, so she's been leaving us alone for this. So, uh, Love you, brother. Love you too, buddy. We'll see you. All right, man.